any case, this will be the final class of the semester that will be covered in the final exam. So today we will be talking about the Christian Bible, the New Testament. Uh, now, just like for the Hebrew Bible, the selection in our textbook is <clears throat> of stories that basically everybody in the West knows or is familiar with. So we won't have time to talk about everything, but I encourage you to read through the rest of the PDF. And also for the final exam, it will help you as well. <clears throat> OK, let's look at our questions this week. One, if Jesus knows that he is the son of God, why do you think he still needs to learn from the temple masters, the teachers at the temple? Two, Jesus says that he comes not to destroy the laws, but to complete them. But he makes a number of changes, including he changes an eye for an eye to turn the other cheek. So do you think this is a contradiction? Why or why not? Three, do you think the parable of the prodigal son makes sense? Why or why not? So Jesus likes to teach by telling stories that are called parables. In Chinese, this is mm -hmm. 语言. Usually when we when we talk about 语言, we think of 动物语言. In English, Parables with animals are called fables. Uh, fables with humans are called parables, so it's basically a similar thing. But parables don't have to have a clear and unambiguous lesson. There should be a lesson, but the lesson does not all is not always very clear. <clears throat> and so uh, one part of the Bible one part of the New Testament is Jesus explaining to his disciples, Tadamansen, why he uses parables that may not always be clear. There's a reason for this. And uh, what the parables don't have names in the Bible. The names that we use for them are uh, were were given by editors later. Uh, so one of them, a very famous parable, they're all famous. One of them is called the parable of the prodigal son. <coughs> the son who was lost and then comes back. Four, why do you think Jesus prays to God for this cup to pass me by? Which means like if he could um, change his fate. If he does not, if it's possible for him not to take up his burden. Even though he knows that it has been written, in other words, foreordained. So like he knows his fate, he knows what he has to do. Why do you think he still prays to God to ask to change his fate? Five, the Gospels, Fuin were probably written as propaganda. Um, in this case, Zhao Xuan. How convincing do you think they might have been at the time? If we look at them as propaganda, how effective were they when they were written and why? OK, let's look at question one. <clears throat> So one day his parents, Mary and Joseph, uh, went to Jerusalem for the Feast of Passover. Passover is a Jewish festival that celebrates when. <clears throat> so, OK, so the story is in Exodus, not in the PDF, but it, it's also a famous story. So a prophet told the king of Egypt that 
uh, the person who would overthrow him is the firstborn son or a firstborn son, and it, he will be born on such and such a day. And so the king ordered every single newborn firstborn son on that day to be killed. Uh, and so to protect his people, God sent an angel to warn the Jewish people and told them if you sacrifice, uh, I think it was a lamb and you put the blood of the lamb on top of your door, there's a meme uh, then the angel will protect them and the government uh, army will not uh, enter their home. So this is the festival of Passover. Right when uh, Egypt's army passed over the Jewish people. Uh, so Mary and Joseph are going to Jerusalem for this festival, and when Jesus was 12 years old, they went up uh, according to their custom or their habit. And had completed their days there, so the festival is over. On their return, the boy Jesus stayed behind in Jerusalem. By the way, Jerusalem in Chinese is Yelu Salen. And his parents did not know it, so they kind of left him behind. And supposing that he was in their company, like he was still with them, they went a day's journey and then looked for him among their relatives and friends. So it's not just Mary and Joseph, right? They have company. It's a group of people, relatives and friends. And when they did not find him, they turned back to Jerusalem in search of him. <coughs> and it happened that after three days, they found him in the temple. I think there's a name for this for Jewish people. I can't remember what you call this. Li Bai Tang Ma or something. They found him in the temple, sitting in the midst of the masters or the teachers, the learned scholars, listening to them and asking them questions. Remember, Jesus is 12. And all who heard him were amazed at his intelligence and his answers. And they were astonished at seeing him, and his mother said to him, Child, why did you do this to us? See, your father and I have been looking for you in distress. Jesus said to them, But why were you looking for me? Did you not know that I must be in my father's house? And they did not understand what he had said to them. And he returned with them and came to Nazareth. This is where they live in Nazareth and was in their charge. Uh, and his mother kept all his sayings in her heart. And Jesus advanced in wisdom and stature. Stature is Sun Wang reputation and in the favor of God and men. So because of this, people started liking him more and God also started liking him more. <clears throat> so this is a very strange story. He talks with these religious teachers at the temple. He's very intelligent. And his answers are very good. Uh, and when his parents ask him where, why didn't you go with us? He says, I must be in my father's house. Now, when Mary, when Mary was pregnant with Jesus, uh, three shepherds, three wise men came and told her that this is the son of God and the savior and all these things. So she, she's not completely confused, right? She knows that her child is special. <clears throat> but perhaps she was not used to thinking of Jesus as the son of God. 
right? She knew that Jesus was special and would be a savior, but didn't know about the relationship between God and Jesus. So when he says I was must be in my father's house, he's talking about the temple. His father is God. Um, but Jesus and Mary did not understand what he was talking about. <clears throat> but today I wanted to ask you, he OK, he is the son of God. He's a holy person. Why does he have to learn about the religion? Right, that's the question I'm asking today. Why does he need to learn from the temple masters? And the answer is probably that. Um, yes, he's holy, he's the son of God, but he also had to grow up from a baby. And being holy, there are many ways to be holy. And not all of them have to do with knowledge. Some holy people don't have the knowledge, they only have the power. They can uh, talk to God or perform miracles, but they don't know the religion behind why. They only have their faith, Xingnian. So even though Jesus is holy and the Son of God, he must have to learn the details of his religion. Now at this point you might think, OK, but then how did he know that he is the son of God? Doesn't he have to learn that too? And I think he did learn this. He probably learned it uh, when talking with the temple masters or some uh, reading or listening to the religion sometime during his young life. How can you tell whether you are the son of God? Well, in Jesus's case, it wasn't simply because three shepherds came and told Mary. Apparently, the circumstances of Jesus's birth <clears throat> fulfilled a number of prophecies in the Hebrew Bible. Um, if you read the introduction PDF to the Christian Bible, in there it says that um, Jesus fulfilled a number of prophecies throughout the Old Testament, throughout the Hebrew Bible. In the Hebrew Bible, which is very long, uh, sometimes prophets will appear and say, your savior will be born to a carpenter and a virgin, right? Or at the age of 12, he will talk with the teachers in the temple. And so when he does these things, he is fulfilling the prophecies. At the same time, uh, uh, supposedly he doesn't know that he's fulfilling the prophecy. Right, he just does what he feels like he should do. But maybe when he's talking with these temple masters, he realizes that he has been fulfilling prophecies. And so by the process of induction, he realizes that he is the son of God. <clears throat> That's one explanation. Another explanation is maybe the part of him that is holy is born with this knowledge, knows who he is and what his life must, and what it must happen in his life. Who knows, right? Uh, God can do anything. A third possible explanation is. Well, well, we'll talk about that in question four. Uh, for now, do you have questions about one? OK, let's look at two. Whether and how he changes the ancient Jewish laws. So uh, this part, he he starts teaching. And this is one of his most famous uh, lessons, the Sermon on the Mount. Sermon in Chinese is Shuo Jiao. Now, of course, in Chinese and also in English, today this word is a negative word, right? Nobody wants to listen to a someone giving you a sermon. 
but really its original meaning is a religious person teaching about religion. So at this moment, Jesus has climbed onto the side of a mountain and he's giving a sermon to a large crowd of people at the foot of the mountain. So it's the Sermon on the Mount. Um, so he starts off with the simple things. Uh, we're we're going to skip this. You can read these if you have uh, interest. But the general idea is that the weak, the poor, the suffering will enter heaven before the rich, the powerful, and the arrogant. Uh, and then the part we're going to discuss starts here. Do not think that I have come to destroy the law and the prophets. I have not come to destroy, but to complete. Indeed, I say to you, until the sky and the earth are gone, not one iota, which means not one little bit, or one end of a letter must go from the law until all is done. So he says he's not uh, getting rid of any single part of the law. Iota is the name for the Greek letter that today we call in English I. <laughs> he who breaks one of the least of these commandments and teaches men accordingly shall be called least in the kingdom of heaven. So again, if you don't follow the laws, you won't enter heaven. OK, so how does he so-called complete the law? You have heard that it was said to the ancients, you shall not murder. Right, we saw this last week in the Ten Commandments, you shall not murder. He who murders shall be liable to judgment, uh, will have to be judged. I say to you that any man who is angry with his brother shall be liable to judgment. And he who says to his brother, fool. So if you call your brother a fool, brother here just means any stranger, any person. Uh, who calls, who says to his brother, fool, shall be liable before the council. And he who says to his brother, sinner, if you call your brother, if you call a stranger a sinner, shall be liable to Gehenna. So the footnote tells us that these three are different levels of punishment. The lightest punishment comes from the local judgment. Then the, the middle severe, middle serious punishment comes from the council. And then finally Gehenna is basically the punishment of death. Gehenna is where they threw their trash, and so if you are sentenced to death and you are killed, your body gets thrown into Gehenna. So on this first point, Jesus is saying not just murder. If you get angry with someone, if you call someone an, a normal insult, if you call someone a sinner without proof, uh, you will also be punished. Is that a contradiction or is that completing the law? Uh, let's keep that in mind as we continue. If, uh, the next point, if then you bring your gift to the altar, so you, you're preparing to sacrifice in a temple, and there remember that your brother has some grievance against you, so like your Wei Jing Zi Si, right? There's some uh later. Someone is still angry at you, maybe someone is suing you in court, that kind of thing. Leave your gift before the altar and go first and be reconciled with your brother. And then go and offer your gift. So you can only sacrifice in the temple if you are not fighting with anyone. Next, you have heard that it has been said you shall not commit adultery. 不能通奸. 
I tell you that any man who looks at a woman so as to desire her has already committed adultery with her in his heart. So the old law says no adultery. Jesus says if you look at a woman and even think about wanting to sleep with her, you have committed adultery in your heart. The, the logic is kind of the same as with the murder one, right? Why do people kill people? For two possible reasons. One, because you're angry. Two, for benefit. So the angry part, Jesus now is saying, if you get angry with a stranger uh, or you call them names, you will be punished. For the benefit part, Jesus goes from the opposite direction. If you're fighting with someone, don't sacrifice. You can only sacrifice in the temple if you're no longer fighting with someone. Usually a grievance or a fight will be about some kind of benefit or some kind of advantage. So this is similar to saying don't kill people. Jesus is trying to get you to resolve causes of murder. If you don't get angry with strangers and you don't fight with people, you probably won't kill people. So this looks like he is completing the law. OK, the adultery one too, right? You only sleep with someone if you want to sleep with someone. So if you don't, if you don't look at someone and want to sleep with them, you won't commit adultery. So he's also completing this law. Next, um, let's see. If a man puts away his wife, let him give her a contract of divorce. So in Jewish law, you can divorce your spouse. But Jesus here says, I tell you that any man who puts away his wife, except for the reason of harlotry, harlotry is like sleeping around with other people, is making her the victim of adultery. And any man who marries a wife who has been divorced is committing adultery. So again, Jesus is trying to resolve the reasons for adultery. If for example, a man who is married sees a woman and wants to sleep with her. He can then divorce his wife for the purpose of sleeping with the other woman. It's legal, but obviously it's not in the spirit of the law. So Jesus is trying to prevent this kind of thing, right? So if you look at another woman and you want to sleep with her, it's adultery. If you divorce someone and you marry another woman, it's adultery. Next one. It has been said to the ancients, you shall not swear falsely. So this is the commandment that says you shall not take the Lord's name in vain. Uh, right, you shall make good your oaths to the Lord. I tell you not to swear at all. Not by heaven because it is the throne of God. Not by the earth because it is the footstool for his feet. A footstool. This is like uh, if your chair is too high, someone will give you something to step on. That is a footstool. And don't swear by Jerusalem because it is the city of the great king. And not by your own head because you cannot make one hair of your head white or black. So any of these things you should not swear by because they are not your things. You cannot control them. They either belong to God or the king or in terms of your hair and your body also belongs to God or nature. You can't change the color of your hair naturally. So if you can't swear oaths, what should you do? Jesus says, let your speech be yes, yes, 
No, no. More than that comes from the evil one. So in other words, the idea is if you swear, that means that people should trust what you say when you swear. But that also means that people should not trust what you say when you don't swear. Jesus again tries to prevent people from sinning. Uh, and he simply says whatever you say should be sincere and true. All right, let your speech be yes, yes, no, no. Yes means yes, no means no, even if you don't swear. So this is also completing the, the law, making it more complete. OK, and then the next one is the one that I asked you about in the question. You have heard that it has been said. An eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth. I tell you not to resist the wicked man, but if one strikes you, Dani, on the right cheek, turn the other one to him also. And if a man wishes to go to law with you and take your tunic, give him your cloak also. And if one makes you his porter for a mile, porter is someone who carries things. For a mile, go with him for two. Give to him who asks, and do not turn away one who wishes to borrow from you. So this seems quite different, right? The original law is an eye for an eye, a tooth for a tooth. But Jesus says, if someone hurts you, let them hurt you more. If they ask something from you, give them twice as much. Seems kind of different, right? To really understand the connection between these two, why is it a completion of the law? You have to understand what so called turning the other cheek. What does this actually mean? It seems kind of stupid, right? If someone's hitting you, why should you let them hit you more? Um, there are, I think, two possible explanations for what Jesus is asking people to do here. One is that if you fight against someone who wants something from you, right, either in the law court or in life, it, someone who wants something from you, even someone who just wants to punish you. If you say no, then what you're doing is you're also making a judgment. You're saying that the other person doesn't deserve what they want from you. And we know that making judgments is only possible if you have knowledge of what is right and what is good what is good, what is not good. How do we have that power? We got it from when Adam and Eve ate the forbidden fruit. Uh, because it is the fruit of the knowledge, uh, 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 the fruit of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. So Jesus here might be asking us to lead a more pure and holy life. Don't make judgments to protect yourself, only make judgments in terms of following Jesus or following God. So if someone wants something from you and it's not related to religion, don't just give it to them, give them even more. If you only give what someone asks, maybe it does not satisfy them, right? Maybe they need more money than they're asking from you. 
Maybe they need um, more help than they're asking from you. So to truly uh, help satisfy the other person's need, you should give them more, even if the need is a need to punish you. Uh, now, the other way to think about this. Well, hang on. So first of all, the first way to think about this, to do more to help others and avoid judging other people. How is that a completion of an eye for an eye, a tooth for a tooth? Well, an eye for an eye, a tooth for a tooth means whatever you lose, you should be able to regain or the other person has to suffer equally. Now, if you think about it, this law looks fair, but it's not really fair. Think about this. If a rich man steals from a poor man and spends that money, uh, I should say if a rich man steals like a goat or a cart, steals something from a poor man and then loses it, then this law would say that the rich man also has to like lose that thing or has to buy a new one for the poor man or something. But the rich man's punishment is not very painful because he's rich. If a poor man steals from a rich man and then loses that thing or that money, then they have to work hard and buy another one to return to the rich man. This punishment is much harsher on the poor man than the rich man. So it looks fair, but it doesn't take into account personal differences in life. Um, and so if it's not just, if it's not fair, the re then why do people still follow this law? Because it is clear, it is unambiguous. It is very clear what the punishment should be. There's no room to argue. There's no way to find a loophole. Zhuan fa ri lo dong. So if the purpose of this original law is clarity, like in other words, you don't have to judge uh, the punishment or you don't have to um, make a judgment about what is right to give back or what is right to take away. If that is the spirit of this law, then Jesus uses the same spirit. You don't have to judge how much to give. Give more. It's also very clear. So, Yesu 一定要让跟你有要求的人，一定要让他满足。某种程度上来说，是呃比较有实质内涵的法律。So that's the first understanding. But there's also another way to think about this. I I'm not sure that this is what Jesus meant, but it's also one way that this could be understood as a law. And it is this. If you ask someone to borrow money from them. And they give you twice as much money. How do you feel? You feel grateful, yes, but you also feel kind of embarrassed or ashamed. Uh, because like when you ask someone for something already, it, it, it means that you need something from someone else. It's not a very comfortable position. 
But when someone gives you more, it emphasizes your discomfort. This uh, applies also to when someone hits you. When someone hits you, or, or let's let's turn this around. When you hit someone, you expect them to fight back. If they don't fight back, if they let if they turn the other cheek and let you hit them even more, it emphasizes how uh, irrational and absurd and silly this situation is that you're hitting someone who doesn't want to fight you. And in that way, that also resolves this situation. It takes care of uh, what is going on. So the哲学家认为, 所以這變相也等於是解決了你遇到的狀況。And it's a better way because in the old law the solution is a punishment. You take something from that person back. But in the new law it's not a punishment, you're giving them even more. So it's a way to solve the situation that helps the other person even more. This is these two uh, between the old law and the new law. The connection between these two is one of the most confusing and complicated and much discussed among all of Jesus's new laws. Uh, so it's worth thinking about this, uh, spending some time to think about the connection. But when we think about it like this, it does seem like the new law is in the same spirit as the old law. And then the, the last one in this paragraph is here. You have heard that it has been said you shall love your neighbor and hate your enemy. I tell you, love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you. Persecute here means abuse, chifuni. So that you may be sons of your father who is in heaven. So doing this would be acting in a holy way, in a religious way. Why? Because he, God, makes his sun rise on the evil and the good and rains on the just and the unjust. So God takes, uh, gives the blessing of nature to everybody. If God doesn't judge when someone is alive, then how can you, a human, judge others? So here Jesus tells you to love your enemies also. So Jesus tells you to love everybody. And then Jesus uses a little logic. If you love those who love you, what reward do you have? So the truly worthy thing to do is to love those who hate you. That is something special. Be perfect as your father in heaven is perfect. So this is the spirit of what Jesus is asking people to do. Be as perfect as you can. OK, so do you have questions about two?
OK, let's move on to three. So Jesus tells a lot of stories and teaches a lot of lessons. This one is about a son who is lost and then comes back. It's kind of long, so I'll give you the, the key points. There was a man who had two sons. And the younger of them, the younger son said to his father. Father, give me my appropriate share of the property. And the father divided his substance between them. And not many days afterward, the younger son gathered everything together and left the country. And there he squandered his substance in riotous living. Uh, so now he's poor. And he's working hard jobs, suffering for money. But then he remembers that his father has money. So he thinks to himself, I will rise up and go to my father and say to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and in your sight. Uh, which means that not only did he insult heaven and God, he also insulted his father by living in such a terrible way. 就是他活的过的那种日子败掉家产，还不只是呃辜负了上天，他还辜负了他父亲。so he's going back to apologize, right? I am no longer worthy to be called your son. Make me like one of your hired servants. So he's going back not to become wealthy as a son. He's going back to work for his father for money. Uh, but, but before he got home, his father saw him on the road and was moved and ran and fell on his neck and kissed him to fall on one's neck uh, right, to hug someone uh, including on the back of the neck that's what this means uh, and then his father said to his slaves quick bring the best clothing and put it on him and have a ring for his hand and shoes for his feet and bring the fatted calf, Fei Yang. Slaughter him and let us eat. And make merry, which means have a party. Because this man, my son, was a dead man and came to life. There's this Sirfuho. Right? He was lost. He was lost and he has been found. So the younger son did not expect any of this. He only wanted to work for his father. But as soon as his father saw him on the road, he hugged him and gave him the best clothing, the best food, and had a party for him. Now, his older son, when he saw what was going on, asked his father, uh, you know, what's up? And his father said, uh, your younger brother came back and we're celebrating. And the older son was angry and did not want to go in. Why was he angry? He said to his father, look, all these years I have been your slave, which means I have worked for you and never neglected an order of yours. I've always followed your orders, but you never gave me a kid. Kid here means uh, a, a young lamb. The word kid in English actually means a baby goat. Anyways, the, the animal that they're eating. And you never gave me a party. But then, you know, this other guy, he wasted his money and now he's coming back and you're celebrating, right? This makes me very mad. And his father said, 
my child, you are always with me, and all that is mine is yours. What are those Anita? But we had to make merry and rejoice. We had to have this party because your brother was a dead man and came to life. He was lost and has been found. End of story. So the idea is the older son always stayed by his father, always followed orders, was a good son. Uh, but his father never threw him a party, never treated him especially well. Yet when this younger son who goes out, wastes all his money, comes back and begs for a job, his father throws a party and celebrates. To the older son, this is unfair. My question is, is it really unfair? Or do you think that his father, his father's actions make sense? Well, to answer this question, there's one part that we should pay very close attention to. The father tells the older son, all that is mine is yours. Uh, maybe not today, right? But maybe after he dies, everything will go to the older son. Which is according to the law. So it's not that the father is treating the younger son better. It's just not yet time to give everything to the older son. So it is not to give everything to the older son. First of all, this is because it's the younger son. But secondly, even if we don't think about older, younger, or inheritance, when you lose something and you find it again, that happiness is much stronger than if you had never lost that thing. Because the point is not how much do you have or what do you have or who do you have? The point is the difference between losing and regaining uh, or the difference between not having and then having. Jesus here is not talking about static assets. He's talking about the human heart, the feeling that people have. Uh, and this is part of Jesus's lesson, not what do you have, but how do you enjoy what you have? And that's part of his lesson. So if you only look at it from like an accounting book, uh, then the older son is correct. Right? The younger son is not worthy of celebrating. But if you look at it from the human heart, from human experience, then it does make sense because the father is celebrating and spreading the joy that he has from regaining his son. And that is at the core of Jesus's religion, human behavior and human relations is the most important part of uh, the Christian faith, according to Jesus. Do you have questions about three? OK, let's take a 10 minute break. Let's see, what were we talking about? Right, four. The question of Jesus's fate.
So this is near the end of Jesus's life. He knows what will happen to him. Uh, partly from the Hebrew Bible, partly because he's the son of God. And I guess when he prays to God. God um, this is important. The person who betrays him is a disciple named Judas. Yoda. So today in English, when you call someone a Judas, you are calling them a traitor. So this is the Last Supper. Uh, we're going to skip this part. After the supper, they go out to the Mount of Olives. Uh, and then on the mountain, they go to a place called Gethsemane. And Jesus said to his disciples, Sit down here while I go over there and pray. Uh, and he took three of his disciples. Um, and he says, my soul is in anguish to the point of death. Stay here and keep watch with me. Then he went a little farther and threw himself down on his face and said in prayer. So first of all, notice how he prays. Today we think of praying as like putting your two hands together and looking towards the sky or something. But he prays in the ancient Jewish way. He kneels and then puts his face on the ground. Kind of like how Muslims pray today. And he prays, Father, if it is possible, let this cup pass me by. So the idea is um, in those days when you're eating with others, you would all share one cup of wine as a sign of trust and your relationship. Um, but here Jesus is calling his fate this cup. Everyone has to suffer uh, in their own way. And for Jesus, his suffering is connected to how he is supposed to die and how he is supposed to save all of humankind. But here he says, if it is possible, let this cup pass me by. Let me avoid drinking from this cup of suffering. Except only let it be not as I wish, but as you wish. So I don't want to suffer. But if you want me, God, if you, God, want me to suffer, I will suffer. Then he goes back and finds his three disciples asleep. And he says, it was just one hour and you guys fell asleep. Stay awake. Uh, and then he goes again to pray, and then he says, uh, if it is not possible for this cup to pass me by, but I must drink it, let your will be done. So he prays asking God to not let him suffer so much. But in the Last Supper, he tells his disciples that he's going to die. And he says, as it has been written, the Son of Man, which is the same thing as the Son of God, goes his way as it has been written for him to do. Okay, Jesus is the Son of God, but he's also the Son of Man, because remember, man was created in the image of God. 
and man is God's favorite creation. So being the son of God also means being the son of man. Goes his way, which means follows his fate as it has been written for him to do. So here it means uh, as it was written in the Hebrew Bible when there's the record of the prophets saying what will happen to Jesus. So he knows that this is his fate and he knows that this is what will happen to him. In public, in front of his disciples, he is confident and sure. But in private, he prays and says, if there's any way possible, please don't let me suffer. So the question is, why does he do this? When he knows that this is his fate, why does he pray for God to spare him? And the answer is because Jesus is only half holy. He is half God, half man. So the God part of him knows what has to happen and is perfectly willing to sacrifice himself for humankind. But the man part of him is still mortal, has he or is still scared of pain and suffering and looks at his fate and doesn't want that to happen. This is an important idea. If Jesus was entirely God and not human at all, then what would it mean for him to sacrifice himself? What meaning would that have? If he cannot feel that sacrifice, not just on his body, but in his heart. The true sacrifice is not leaving behind the body. The true sacrifice is the pain and suffering of the process. So ku so nan cai shi zi wo xi sheng de he xing. Ren sheng ren shi mei you shen tai da liao bu qi. Zi so ku de bu fen. And so that's why Jesus had to be half human. He had to have a part of himself that could feel the sacrifice in order for it to be a true sacrifice. And so in the Bible, we have stories, one or two stories about Jesus expressing that fear and that pain. The other one uh, we're not going to, to read, but it's in the textbook, is just like he's nailed to the cross, right? Right before he dies. OK, I'll, I'll uh, let you see it. Right before he dies. Uh, he calls out. In a great voice saying, Eli, Eli, Lema Sabachthani. This is in Aramaic, which is a kind of Greek. What does this mean? It's my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? So this is the human part of him. But like, this is also very interesting. He says that God has forsaken him, that God has given him up. So does this mean that Jesus died in despair? This is a very unusual thing to happen to the holiest human being. All his life, he says, he is the son of God, uh, that he is here to complete the old laws. And yet at the very end, he expresses despair. He loses faith in his destiny. 
This is a very big paradox. But it also gives people hope. If even Jesus could lose his faith at the hardest moment of his life, and he could still fulfill his holy mission, then we humans, if we lose our faith in the hardest moment of life, that does not mean we are forever lost. We can also be prodigal sons and prodigal daughters. We can also return to God. So even Jesus's death is part of his lesson, part of his teaching. OK, do you have questions about four? Okay, so if you don't have other questions or ideas, number five. The Gospels were maybe or probably written as propaganda. Uh, last week I mentioned that there are four Gospels. The Gospel of Matthew was written for Jewish people. The Gospel of Luke was written for educated people. Uh, these are the two Gospels that our textbook has chosen from. And then we have the Gospel of Mark, which was written for non-Jewish people. It's also the shortest one. And the fourth one is the Gospel of John, which was written as a kind of religious explanation. And it's also the longest gospel, and it's the most different from the other three gospels. So each gospel is aimed at a different reading audience. Each gospel tries to answer the specific questions of its readers. So the Gospel of Matthew will try to connect Jesus's ideas with the Jewish faith or the Jewish religion. The Gospel of Luke will explain ideas using Greek philosophy. The Gospel of Mark will explain the situation of, Ju of Jesus's life and help people who live far away to understand what Jesus is saying. And the Gospel of John will try to explain using religious ideas why Jesus is the Son of God. So each Gospel is aimed at a different group of people. So if we think about that, and we think about how each Gospel shows the life of Jesus, and we think about what Jesus teaches and what he does, do you think that people reading about these things or hearing about these things would be convinced? On the one hand, it's quite convincing, right? If you read a biography of Jesus and his teaching and that biography explains all of your questions, that's quite powerful. But of course, when someone comes up to you and says, here, read this, it tells you about the son of your God. It's not something that you would believe very easily. So the New Testament, the Christian Bible, doesn't just have the four Gospels, right? It also has a record of Jesus's disciples going around and teaching what Jesus taught. It also has a record of the disciples letters that they wrote to communities far away that they couldn't reach, explaining and answering questions. So when you put all of it together, 
it is very convincing. But the core, 最核心的部分, has to be Jesus the person and his ideas. The New Testament, the Christian Bible, is kind of like the Analects of Confucius, 像《论语》一样. It was written years after the main guy had died. Uh, so all of these stories about Jesus's life and his ideas were written from memory and written from like uh, notes and things like that. We don't have any quotes directly from Jesus himself. So there's a lot of scholarship about how did the early church fathers, the founders of this religion, how did these disciples choose what to include in the Christian Bible and what to leave out. I mentioned the Dead Sea Scrolls, Si Hai Sou Chaldren. These are collections of material that were not added to the Bible. So at the time, Jesus himself did not say like, these are uh, what you have to do in church. These are how you should worship me. He taught mostly uh, moral ideas and also some ideas about the religious law, but it was not a complete religious system, right? He kept saying that he wanted to complete the old laws, not make new ones. So it's only his disciples who organized these things and added details to create a coherent religious system. And when you create a complete system, you have to leave some things out. Uh, so this is currently a very active area of scholarship, studying the parts of the early Christian Bible that were left out and why. So the entire Christian Bible, not just the four Gospels, can be seen as a kind of propaganda, a kind of teaching. And judging by the size of the Christian church today, I would have to say that uh, ultimately it became quite convincing. It became so convincing that the German, sorry, the Roman Emperor Constantine converted to Christianity before he died. And when you get an emperor to believe in your religion, you know that your religion is going to be big. OK, do you have questions about five? OK, if not, then the moment you have all been waiting for. The final exam. Let me show you the exam and I will be here to answer your questions. The exam will begin. As soon as class is over. The rules are the same as the midterm exam. Um, remember, you must give specific evidence from the assigned readings, including page and line numbers, unless the thing has no line numbers. But give me a specific evidence and specific location. If you use outside information, give me where you found the information and which part is from outside. Uh, to help you, I have added an example essay question answer. This is from another class. Um, so, the answer itself will not help you, 
but the way that it is written may help you. So they have specific evidence from a specific place in the text. Specific, sorry, specific evidence, specific place. And you'll notice that the answer is in the form of an essay. 它不只是条列式，它写了一篇散文，一篇申论文章. So if you're not sure how to give a good answer, you can look at this file and look at the structure. 看它答案的结构. Okay, questions. There are three possible questions. Choose only one is fine. Question one. Do you consider the stories of the lost books of the Odyssey to be myths? Why or why not? Yes or no? You can give a partial answer. You can say that some of the stories, we read four stories. You can say that some are myths and some are not. But if you do this, well, not if you do this, you should always discuss all four stories. Now, what is a myth? Define myth using evidence from the metamorphoses. So, what is a myth? Please come up with your own idea using the stories in the metamorphoses. So you can say like, we know that the metamorphoses are myths. So you can say like, we know that 说 Lost Books 这四篇故事分别是不是神话? Do you have questions about the first question? Okay, question two. How much of Oedipus's fate in Oedipus Tyrannos do you think is his own fault and why. 他那个悲惨的命运有多少应该归咎他本人的身上? So to answer this question, discuss both his actions and Apollo's prophecy. Uh, 所以你不但他个人行为,他身上的预言也请讨论。Depending on your answer, either explain why Oedipus should bear responsibility or some responsibility despite the prophecy, or why he should bear no responsibility despite his actions. So, if you think he should or at least a little responsibility, you should explain why Oedipus 即便有这个预言在那边，他还是要扛一些责任。相反的，如果你觉得他什么责任都不用负的话，你也要说明为什么这个过程是由他个人行为所导引，但是他却不用负任何责任。所以两个两个角度都要去做比较。And the best answer will examine at least three significant plot points. OK, do you have questions about two? Uh, you don't have to give me like a percentage. The Beyond Show by Vin B. How how much Beyond the Majin Jun? He's actually what is my Trimbua and door. He didn't then was a male to later, right? Given some that guy was all. Roughly how much doesn't have to be too accurate. Okay, then question three. 
would you describe the God of the Hebrew Bible and the God of the Christian Bible as the same God? If yes, why? If no, why not? You must answer either yes or no. You cannot say sometimes, a little bit, maybe. You have to choose one, either yes or no. Now, for the Christian Bible, God here only includes Jesus when he's teaching or performing miracles. Uh, as I just said, Jesus is half God, half human. So for this question, you only have to think about the parts of Jesus that are God. So like when he's teaching, so that's uh, the holy part of him. Or when he's performing miracles, I don't think there are too many miracles in our textbook. But for things that may seem miraculous, the best answer will give at least three examples of similarities or dissimilarities. In your answer, weigh the evidence and choose either yes or no. Which means that when you have three comparison examples, they may not all give you the same answer. So you have to weigh the evidence. So yeah Okay, do you have questions about three? Do you have questions about the exam in general? We're going to end here. Um, if you have questions about anything, I will be here to answer your questions. Okay, uh, you have one week. Good luck on the exam.